Proverbs uh, 13 says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. In the fifth chapter of Romans, we read that hope does not disappoint. Hope is so essential to a good life. When we are hopeful, when we are optimistic about things that are going on in our lives, and we are hopeful about the future, it colors everything about our lives. Uh, and when a person does not have hope, or when that hope is deferred, then that colors the totality of their lives, and in a very negative way. I have been privileged over the years uh, to personally experience uh, the infusion of hope uh, into the lives of people. And I have seen what that means. I remember one day I was sitting in my office uh, in America's Georgia, and the city marshal came in. And uh, he said, Miller, I want to show you the worst house in America's Georgia. I said, sorry, Marshal, I've already seen it. <laughs> I was sure I had seen the worst house because I had seen a lot of houses in America's and I didn't believe that the city marshal could show me anything worse than, than what I had already seen. No, he said, come on. Come on, get in the car. I want to take you and show you the worst house. And before too long, we were in front of a house which was absolutely the worst house <laughs> I had ever seen. <laughs> the boards were falling off. It was unpainted. The roof was obviously leaking. The windows were broken. The front door was hanging on its hinges. And worst of all, the house was visibly leaning to the right. <laughs> I found myself as I stood there leaning to the left, trying to help it out. <laughs> I thought it might fall down while we were actually looking at it. Well, we went up and uh, met the people who lived in that terrible house. It was a double amputee uh, named Johnny Jones. And he was living there with his wife, Dorothy. And that was just about one of the most hopeless, pitiful situations I had ever seen. Johnny was literally a prisoner in that house because unless somebody came and lifted him out, uh, he just had to stay in the house day after day after day after day. I mean, they just hated living in that terrible house. And uh, we found out that uh, Johnny uh, owned the property, so that was not a problem. And we made arrangements to move the two of them to a nearby house temporarily. And we tore this old shack down. And in its place, we built a modest but a good and solid house for them to live in. While the construction was going on, uh, we did the appropriate legal work. And we found out that the house was in the name of Johnny Jones, but his wife's name was not on the deed. So I went to Johnny and I said, uh, Johnny, we've discovered that this property is, is in your name only. Uh, would it be okay if we put Dorothy's name on there so if something happened to you, she could get the house without any legal difficulties? Johnny looked at me and he looked at Dorothy. He says, yeah, I guess that'll be all right. I'm going to keep her. <laughs> he said, there ain't but one thing wrong with her. She cusses. I said, Dorothy, is that right? Do you curse? Yes, yeah, she said, I can't lie. I, I do curse, but it's because of that blankety-blank kitchen. And she didn't say blankety-blank. <laughs> she used a very colorful curse word. She said, but as soon as I get my new house and my new kitchen, I won't have to curse anymore. <laughs> well, finally the house was finished, and amidst great rejoicing, they moved in. There was a good ramp coming out of the front door. Johnny was no longer a prisoner. He could come and go as he pleased. And they were comfortable. There was good insulation. The roof didn't leak. The windows were not broken. The door was properly hung. And it was one of the most joyous experiences of infusing hope uh, into the lives of those two, those two people. Well, they lived very happily in that house for more than 10 years. And one time, I was off on a speaking trip. And when I came back home, I got the word uh, that Johnny had died. I went over to the house, and Dorothy was sitting in the living room, 
uh, with a couple of friends who had come over to uh, deliver their condolences. And I sat there and visited with them for a while, and then I uh, asked Dorothy, uh, Dorothy, where did Johnny die? A big smile came on her face. She said, he died right here in the living room. He got sick, she said, and we took him to the hospital, and we all knew, and he knew, that he wasn't going to make it. And she said he told me, Dorothy, take me home. I want to die in my house. I want to be in that house which brought us so much joy and so much hope. It was a beautiful experience and filled me with great joy to know that I had been a small part of making that possible for that couple. There was another similar experience uh, that occurred in North Georgia more recently. This was just a few months ago. There was a mother named Beverly, and she lived in a mobile home with her uh, mentally challenged son, 39-year-old son, David. This mobile home was absolutely awful. It was full of mold. There was a huge hole in the floor. They had to carefully walk around it to keep from falling literally through uh, the hole down onto the ground. And uh, unfortunately, they didn't have the financial resources uh, to, to get anything better. And they went to them and they said, we will work with you on getting you a good, decent place to live. And so Beverly and her son David moved in with her sister uh, temporarily and they dragged the old mobile home off to the dump. And in its place, they built a modest but good, solid house for Beverly and for David. I was privileged to go just a few months ago to the dedication of the new house. I got there a little early, and, uh, and Beverly and David especially were so excited. <laughs> and so David insisted he must give me a tour of the house. So we were walking through the house, and he was just jumping up and down, bubbly excited to, as we went from room to room. And finally, we came to his room. For a long time, David had had a desire to have his own room, and he wanted it to be blue. <laughs> and this room was a rich, dark blue, and David was thrilled. And there was a ceiling fan in, the, in, the, in his room, and every blade was painted a different color. <laughs> David was so excited to have his own room painted blue with a ceiling fan and every blade was a different color. Well, after the tour, we went outside and we started the dedication program. Different people spoke and there were songs and, and then they asked me to speak and I said things appropriate for a house dedication service. And finally, I uh, looked over at David and I said, David, you know, I want to come and have supper with you. He said, don't just walk in. We got a doorbell. Ring the doorbell. <laughs> and I thought about that, and, and I realized what hope we had brought to that family. A solid floor, good walls, a roof that didn't leak, no hole anywhere, and a blue room <laughs> with a ceiling fan with every blade colored to, uh, painted a different color, and a doorbell. Don't just walk in. <laughs> Ring the doorbell. <laughs> I would say to you, infuse your lives with inspiration and build hope in the world for yourself and for others. Thank you.